will come back. When we will now continue session four on practical experiences in the application of past risk management in trade, I will invite the first speakers from session four joining us online. Mr. Richard Fiti Prasert and Mr. Jose Hernandez to please press the raise hand button. You are kindly requested to stay online after your presentation until the end of the QA session. Session four will cover practical experiences and case studies in the application of risk, past risk management in trade, as well as the use of reference database and the tools developed by international intergovernmental organizations. I will now give the floor to Mr. Richard Fiti Prasert, ad advisor at the National Bureau of Agricultural Commodity and Food Standards of Thailand, to present on Thailand experiences on past risk management to facilitate trade. Mr. Thiti Prasad, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good evening from Bangkok, Thailand, and good afternoon to the, those participants in Geneva. Um, I'm Richard Thiti Prasad. I'm advisor to the uh, National Bureau of Agricultural Commodity and Food Standards. Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, Thailand. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizer for inviting Thailand to participate in the thematic session on international standards and best practice in case risk identification, assessment, and management. Um, my presentation is uh, on the topic of Thailand experiences on pace risk management um, to facilitate trade. The aim of my presentation is to exchange views and experiences among member countries of the WTO SPS agreement on how to facilitate trade with minimum impact under the framework of the WTO and SPS agreement and uh, International Frank Protection Convention. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, pace risk management is at heart of the pace risk analysis. Why is that? How important it is? Uh, I will give uh, more detail uh, later on. Uh, Thailand, as a member of the country of the International Crime Protection Convention, and the WTO uh, SPS agreement has an obligation to comply with the rules and regulation stipulated in the said international agreement. And to fulfill the obligation, Grand Quarantine Act was enacted in 1964. Since then, it has been amended by Grand Quarantine Act number two in 1999. And lastly, by Grand Quarantine Act number three in 2008. In addition, the principal concept of the price risk analysis has been incorporated into the Grand Quarantine Act number three in 2008. The main objective of the Grand Quarantine Act is to safeguard our economy, in Thailand, in this case, in particular in agricultural environment and human health. On the other hand, to consume, to ensure that plant and plant products exporting from Thailand are free from plant quarantine trace and complying with the requirement of the importing country. Uh, furthermore, as a member of International Plant Protection Convention, Department of Agriculture has been designated as the National Plant Protection Organization and National Bureau of Agricultural Commodity and Food Standards as contact point. As a member of the WTO SPS agreement, SCFS has been designated as the notification authority and national inquiring point. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me elaborate on the legislation on Pan Quarantine Act. Uh, Pan Quarantine Act is the core regulation regarding pest risk analysis. Uh, in relation to international trade, it can be divided into two main sector uh, sections, namely export and import. There are two main uh, sections under the Pan Quarantine Act. Um, first of all, I would like to, to explain or to give more detail on exportation procedures. Pacific analysis is a is carried out uh, aiming to ensure that the export plant and plant products are free from plant protein pests in, comp in compiling with the importing country requirement, a phytosanitary measure of importing country. On the other hand, uh, for importation of the plant and plant products, this risk analysis is implemented to control and safeguard our agricultural environment and human health with the phytosanitary measure in accordance with the international standard. According to the Plant Quarantine Act 1964 and as amended, Imported articles are categorized into three categories. Uh, first, prohibited article. The second is restricted article. And lastly, non-prohibited article. Um, the main uh, objective of the of the Plant Quarantine Act is to prevent, as I just mentioned, introduction of pest and disease. Uh, into the country. Um, importing of the prohibited on, and restricted articles under the Plant Quarantine Act, the, basically, plant phytosanitary certificate is required. And for prohibited articles, this is the most important article. Um, permission from the Department of Agriculture is required prior to the importation. And the phytosanitary certificate from the National Plant Protection Organization of the Air Force Lincoln Tea shall be accompanied with the consignment. Uh, in 2007, the Director General of the Department of Agriculture has issued the notification on criteria, procedures, and condition in performing pest risk analysis for importation of prohibited article as a guidance. In addition, in 2008, Minister, Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives uh, prescribed the ministry and notification as a guidance on criteria, procedures, and conditions for importation uh, or bringing in chances of prohibit restricted and non-prohibited articles. Trading partner country should understand and act according to the aforementioned notification. Is this very important for uh, exporting country to understand our law and regulation and complying with the regulation prescribed uh, under the Plan Quarantine Act, as I just mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. We are not aiming for the zero risk. That is very important. Uh, but to minimize the risk to acceptable level with reasonable option is uh, our objective of the uh, Pacific analysis. With this objective, I would like to present an example on how to manage the risk of Imported, imported article into Thailand. Uh, in 2012 and 2020, Thailand and France have agreed and attributed 
procedures and condition for importation of fresh apple and kiwi fruits respectively into China. After an intensive consultation, both countries agree on term of exportation of apple and kiwi fruits from France into Thailand. Uh, that's a, this is an example how we dealing with the uh, patriarch analysis on, on international trade. Uh, <clears throat> under the, the, the agreement, the, the criteria on condition as follow up, permitted is required prior to importation of the apple and uh, kiwis from France. That is the first one and, and the most important one. The second one is all charge and packing house shall register with the National Plant Production Organization of France. Uh, third one is the treatment. Co-treatment is required. Uh, the treatment is agreed upon by both country to uh, taking care of the food fries, which is a uh, uh, service in, in, in European country and in many, in this particular is in France. Phytosanitary certificate share accompany with the consignment, uh, which is uh, the one important as well. The important consignment shall be inspect, shall be inspect. I would like to, to repeat again, it shall be inspect at the port of entry. Uh, inspect to find if any in pest or concern associated with the, with the consignment or not. In case, if can contain pest as a, Specify in notification I just mentioned. The authorities shall have the power to treat it, confiscate it, destroy, or send the consignment out of the country. That is the authority uh, power under the Plant Quarantine Act and agreed upon by both countries, Thailand and France. The importation shall commence only after the Department of Agriculture audited and certified with the export certification procedures of the exporting country. Uh, I would like to emphasize here is the challenges and difficulty. Um, first one is the limited of pest database uh, concerning biology of pests and distribution of pests of concern. The second one is the treatment. Uh, it is very important as well because treatment is mean that the cost and benefit and the effective uh, to control plant quarantine pests. And last one is the terms of auditation of exportation procedure. Uh, we have to agree as a bilateral, uh, not agreement the bilateral uh, agree upon term on the auditation. Uh, next slide, please. Let me move on to the other aspect of the risk management. Uh, as all of you, we, we know that as Thailand is an exporting country in agricultural products. Uh, I would like to give an example on on, on the difficulty and challenge on the, uh, the aspect of the uh, exporting country of the fresh fruits uh, in this particular, the mangoes, uh, fresh fruit to the country. We export uh, mango fruits, I mean fresh fruit to many countries. And the different importing country require different treatments for the same crop to treat the same pace. And this is the, the, the difficulty for exporting country uh, which China have facing. Um, treatment is mean cost 
different treatments, different costs uh, and benefit of, and the effectiveness of the treatment. So as a ex exporting country, we have to comply with the requirement from the importing country. Uh, that is the, uh, I would like to take into this consideration of the cost benefit and effectiveness of the treatment for exporting country. In this particular, for Thailand, we have facing difficulty to fulfill with the importing country requirement. Um, next slide, please. Based on our experiences, there is a big challenge regarding to the uh, central, I mean, the international uh, acceptance database for using as the reference uh, data, uh, particularly on PACE, uh, the difference common name of PACE, not only to insect, but also weeds and microorganisms or other diseases. Uh, we need a scientific uh, nomenclature system that we I can identify and understand clearly uh, we, uh, the difference of the region in, uh, and climate may be affected spreading of the pest plus a different host which may be uh, localized or indigenous plant. And second one is the treatment. Because of the different, as I just mentioned, the different types of pests, I mean, uh, regions or climates, analytical tools, uh, technology, research study, and financial support can be a limitation of the data, scientific evidence, and credit stating using the uh, pace risk management. And in this uh, case, treatment is is a barrier uh, for in many cases for the exporting country. And therefore, if we can set up the central, I mean, international acceptance database to be a standard reference information support for the pest risk management, it may reduce bias of the important export condition. This can encourage more flexibility and facilitate trade between importing country and, and the exporting countries. Next slide, please. Although we have talked about the obstacle and challenge, I mean, difficulty of the pressure management to improve capacity of trust facilitation, it does not mean that the pressure management, at, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, cause a trade barrier. We can facilitate it, trade it by using the suitable uh, analysis system and uh, the international acceptance of the anal analysis system. Next slide, please. Uh, I think the yeah, go back to the, 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 the slide on the, the, the statistics. May I? Yes. Um, and, and this slides show the statistics of imported and exported very well, agricultural and food products uh, during uh, 2018 and 2021. The, you can see the average value of both exporting and importing. Uh, for let's say 4.6 and 4.2 billion US dollar respectively. Um, Thailand is an, an exporting country. However, we appreciate our trading partner uh, and parties, member parties uh, to comply with the, our pace risk management uh, for the importing uh, community. Uh, Therefore, both export and import can be facilitated uh, thoroughly. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, that all together, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. Is very strict is very strict management is that hub of very strict analysis. This is the I would like to quote and quote is how important the very strict management uh, in very strict analysis. Uh, that come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for attention. My presentation will come to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Titi Prasad. I now invite Mr. Jose Hernandez, Senior Risk Manager of uh, the Plan Protection and Quarantine Program in the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, FIS slash PPQ of the United States, to present on the PPQ risk management process. Mr. Hernandez, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, as you mentioned, my name is Jose Hernandez, and I am a Senior Risk Manager of Plant Pathology. I am currently working for in, in PPQ, which is Plant Protection and Quarantine, in APHIS, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is the United States of America Quarantine Service. And I work in the regulatory process of importation of plants and plant products. I will give an overview of our regulatory process, particularly in the selection of risk mitigation measures to be included in a risk management document or RMD. Next slide, please. In these slides, uh, you will see an overview of the market access process. First, the exporting country MPPO or National Plant Protection Organization of the country makes an formal request to APHIS that specifies what they are intending to export. Then the PPRA group or plant best risk analysis conducts a PRA or best risk assessment to evaluate the risk involved in the process import pathway. After the PRA is finalized, AFIS IRM or import regulations and manuals, which is my group, will develop the risk management document or RMD. After the RMD is finalized, it will be posted for stakeholder consultation before the regulatory changes are made officially. The risk management document integrates technical policy and operational risk management principles. Technical principles evaluate the efficacy of the measure. Policy principles align proposed mit mitigations with international standards, AFIS regulations, and precedents. An operational perspective evaluate if the measures can be implemented into standards process that are auditable and replicable. Next slide, please. Here are some questions that should be guide the de development of a risk management measure. The first is, what can be done to reduce the risk, which involve an assessment of the individual risk management measures to determine the efficacy? The second question we ask is, how much risk management is appropriate to reduce the risk of entry and establishment of pests? The restrictive restrictiveness of the measure should match the best risk. Third, what options are feasible? Will the measures we propose be standardizable and replicable and auditable? Finally, knowing the thresholds associated with the selected measures will be important for the evaluating, evaluation of the efficacy of the program. Next slide, please. We use several tools that can mitigate the pest risk. This includes phyto phytosanitary inspection or certification. Next, please, in the motion one. Yes. 
a phytosanitary inspection and certification with an important requirement that the exporting MPPO should comply within the country of origin. Because the MPPO is attesting that the imported material are clean, and then APIS can hold that country accountable, that makes an important baseline tool. Hastings can specify the requirement for exports such as treatment, defining the origin of the plants, or requirement of test. Next one, please, in the motion. If this can, um, an uh, inspection in the port of entry will be, will catch a lot of pests, specifically be, visual pests or visible pests. Post of port of entry quarantine or other post entry quarantine measures, for example, on shore fumigation, are further measures that will mitigate the risk after the commodity is in the United States. Go for the next one, please. And all of them. One, the risk management tool. One of the risk management tools also, the extreme one, will be restricting the entry or outreach that will be the prohibition. Next slide, please. Inspection is the most frequent use measure for phytosanitary certification. IPTC defines inspection as an official visual examination. Special forms of examination used to inspect the commodity can include laboratory, laboratory testing, microscopic examination. Inspection can occur in different stages. For example, at the port of entry in the importing country, in the exporting country, could occur in as risk management option during various stages, for example, before, during, or after harvest of plant and plant products. Some of the considerations in deciding on how or when to employ the inspection will be the efficacy, the efficiency, the sensitivity of the available methods, the expertise required to conduct the inspection, whether pests can be detected, and the easier way that they can be detected. Next slide, please. Mostly when people think about treatment, they think about procedures of killing pests. But as you can see from the IPTC definition of treatment, treatment also includes procedures of removal, sexual esterilization, revitalization, sort of mortality. New treatments must be reviewed and approved by APHIS. And then APHIS can add them to the treat treatment manual through a notice-based process in the federal register. Treatment issues consider efficacy of the treatment and questions as, has the treatment been documented? It is reliable. Is it cost effective? Can the commodity tolerate the treatment? Treatment development can take years and they are not always guaranteed. Next slide, please. IPPC defines host and species capable under certain natural conditions of sustaining a specific pest or other organism. When evidence exists that the commodity meets this host definition for the given pest, then that pest is addressed. Sometimes certain plant taxas are host only under certain circumstances, such as stages of maturity or other physiological or physical conditions. These are conditional hosts. The host status can implement the strength of the risk management measure required. Next slide, please. Pest-free concepts are other risk management strategy. Probably the most familiar pest-free concept is pest-free area and also pest-free pest of production. This concept rely in biological, physical, and natural, other natural barriers. They include regulation of the movement of the host material into the defined free area, require routine surveillance and monitoring, and must include contingency plans 
in the event the free area is broken. IPPC defines area Lopez prevalence as an area whether all, part of the country, or part of several countries in which the specific pest is present at low levels and is subject to effective surveillance and control measures according to ISPM 5. Area of uh, areas of low pest prevalence concept can be used as part of systems approaches. Next slide, please. Systems approaches are increasingly being used as an alternative of a single risk management measure, which may not be available. Systems approaches are defined under ISPM 5 as specific options that integrate different measures, at least two of which act independently with a cumulative effect. Systems approaches may include cultural practices, treatment, packing export procedures that result in overlapping lay layers of protection. ISPM 14 states that systems approaches may be considered when one or more of the following circumstances apply, when individual measures are unavailable or restricted, when individual measures can be monitored and corrected, when pest and pest host relationship are well known, and when prevalence of a host pest is known and can be monitored. The requirement of monitoring the efficacy of the measures may be difficult or resource intensive, but combining measures can be quite effective. Next slide, please. The risk management document that we create has an introduction that may include the current regulations of the plant material in the US, the initiating event, and the quarantine pest finding in the pest risk assessment executive, executive summary. The, sec, the second section are the proposed mitigation measures. This section is further split into general or baseline measures and to a specific measures management the risk, manage, uh, the risk measures uh, general are those required for programs, such as, for example, planting growing media program. So specific measures are those needed outside of the programs or, and also those that are not covered in the CFR or Code of Federal Regulations. The discussion section of the, the document explains the system's approach measures and how the mitigation measures will decrease the chance of pest following the pathway. Finally, next slide, please. Once the risk management document is completed, and sometimes even before it is completed, a summary of the proposed requested measures are shared with the MPPO of the country requesting the measures for country consultation. Changes to the risk management document may or may not result from this consultation. The risk management document and the best risk assessment are provided as supporting documents when the proposed rule is published for public consultation or public comments. After reviewing the comments and making any required modification from the PRA or risk management document, the final notice granting or not, market taxes is published. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you very much again. And questions are welcome. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez, and your interesting pictures in your slides. The floor is now open for questions related to the two presentations from Mr. Thiti Prasert and Mr. Hernandez. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, I see you, you have the floor. Thank you, I have a question for Mr. Hernandez. Um, can you give us an indication, because we heard from Chile that they have five staff allocated to pest risk assessment. Um, how many staff does APHIS have allocated to pest risk assessments and, and how do you deal with the 
with the workload which is imposed on you. Um, second, uh, can you give us an indicative timeline on, on how long does the pest risk assessment take in, 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 normal, in normal circumstances? Thank you. Yes. Well, we have different offices that work in different documents. One of the offices that we have is, um, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, is TPRA, or Plant Pest Risk Analysis, the name of the group. This group is located in Raleigh, North Carolina. That group uh, is in charge of this development of the document. The doc, uh, we have around 80 people there, but they are have different functions. They are divided for people who works in a pest risk assessment for importing and exporting, and they create many several other documents that when we have some risk of we need some information, like for example, white papers and collecting for, for different reasons. So um, the, it's always a challenge uh, because it's, um, it's a lot of uh, requests for uh, MPPOs to, um, uh, for market access. And we try to have a priority um, the priority will be a summary of um, different different elements, like uh, for a priority of the country and a priority of the sum of countries. We have a certain capacity of produce pest risk assessments that you know uh, uh, varies each year. We have to put a top of maybe around 20, between 20 and 30, probably according to the length of them uh, each year. Is not if I answer your question, but that's it. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Is there any other question or comment? I see none. Uh, I understand that Mr. Uh, Abdoulaye Ndiaye and uh, Dr. Mary Lu. Mary Lucy Orangje, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, are with us in the room in Geneva today. I will first give the floor to Mr. Abdullaye Ndiaye, head of the Federal Sanitary Leg Legislation Division and the Plan Quarantine of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Equipment of Senegal to present on evaluation and best practices in phytosanitary risk management applied to the mango sector, constraints in Senegal and uh, in Africa. Mr. Ndiaye, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président, de nous avoir donné la parole. Avant d'aller plus loin, je voudrais juste euh, signaler que je suis aujourd'hui ici à Genève Évidemment, en présence du premier secrétaire de notre mission permanente auprès des Nations Unies ici à Genève, M. Fall, que je tiens à remercier. Bonjour à tous les délégués également. Donc, effectivement, on nous avait demandé de préparer un peu une expérience pratique de gestion du risque phytosanitaire dans le commerce. Nous avons choisi une filière très stratégique pour l'Afrique en général, notamment la mangue. Suivant. Bon, donc, du point de vue du cadre normatif de l'analyse des risques phytosanitaires, nous ciblons un peu ces normes ici que vous voyez. La norme numéro 1 sur le principe de quarantaine végétale de la CIPB, les NIMP 2, 11 et 21, et la NIMP 32, relative à la classification des marchandises selon le risque. Suivant. Allô, suivant. Voilà. Pour l'ARP, évidemment, je pense que ça a été déjà bien expliqué par la CIPV. Les différentes étapes, notamment la mise en route, l'évaluation des capacités de, du risque phytosanitaire, j'allais dire. Et là, j'avoue qu'à ce niveau, il y a beaucoup de travaux qui ont été menés, surtout pour cette filière en question notamment pour protéger les pays de destination, parce que nous sommes dans ce cas un pays exportateur. Et également, nous nous apposantissons beaucoup sur la gestion du risque phytosanitaire en tant que gestionnaire. Le risque étant identifié, nous nous sommes chargés en tant qu'ONPV de gérer un peu le risque phytosanitaire. L'étape 4, la communication sur le risque est pratiquement transversale. Suivant. 
Ok, voilà. Bon, là, c'est le schéma hein, qui a été repris après. Parce que pour l'AFP, quand même, il faudrait dire qu'on n'est pas toujours obligé de la mener à son terme. Si effectivement, il n'y a pas de risque identifié, à tout moment, on peut effectivement arrêter la procédure de notre risque phytosanitaire. Ce qui n'est pas quand même le cas pour cette filière manque que nous avons choisi, du fait, en tout cas, de ravageurs importants économiquement auxquels nous sommes tout le temps confrontés au niveau de l'Afrique. Suivant. Voilà, suivant. Voilà, en termes de meilleures pratiques, là, on va être plus concret sur surtout l'évaluation et la gestion des risques phytosanitaires applicables à la filière manque en Afrique, en Afrique de l'Ouest particulièrement, parce que nous sommes pratiquement dans les mêmes écosystèmes et avons donc les mêmes problèmes par rapport à cette mouche de quarantaine. Suivant. Bon, pour la partie d'identification des risques, généralement, on commence même par les opérateurs, disons, par les petites et moyennes entreprises qui ont l'obligation de s'enregistrer au niveau de l'ONPV, ce qui nous permet de les catégoriser selon le niveau de risque, disons, qu'elles peuvent, qu peuvent représenter ces PME en trois catégories A, B, C. Et cela nous permet également de définir un plan annuel de contrôle avec délégation du premier niveau aux entreprises, en fait l'autocontrôle. Et je signale que nous sommes effectivement dans cette approche d'utilisation de l'assurance volontaire par les tiers pour un peu l'expérimenter dans la filière manque. Suivant. Voilà, ainsi décrit un peu le système national de contrôle. À ce, c'est les autorités compétentes qui font les contrôles officiels, aussi bien pour la surveillance, et les contrôles de conformité commerciale et contrôles phytosanitaires. Maintenant, il est délégué aux opérateurs privés les autocontrôles, aussi bien en, période de, en zone de production qu'au niveau des stations de conditionnement. Et à ce niveau, il y a des procédures qui sont définies au niveau de l'ONPV, partagées avec toutes les parties prudentes, pour que véritablement, on ait véritablement une visibilité par rapport à tout ce qui se fait dans le cadre du commerce des produits agricoles. Suivant. Pour les normes que nous ciblons, effectivement, nous avons beaucoup travaillé sur la NEMP 14, sur l'utilisation des mesures intégrées, et également la NEMP 35, l'approche systématique systémique, j'allais dire, de gestion du risque phytosanitaire lié aux mouches des fruits, surtout les défrudités qui nous causent quand même pas mal de problèmes. Et c'est de là qu'on a eu, d'ailleurs, avec l'Union européenne en tout cas, ce document d'approche systémique qui nous a permis toutes ces années en tout cas de rassurer du point de vue de la qualité de la banque qui était exportée sur ce marché. Suivant. Voilà, l'approche systémique, c'est des mesures de gestion intégrées Évidemment, en combinaison de plusieurs facteurs et méthodes de lutte efficaces à tous les niveaux, à tous les moyens en tout cas, aussi bien en pré-récolte, récolte et post-récolte, et même au conditionnement et expédition. Donc il y a partout des bonnes pratiques qui sont en tout cas conseillées pour que véritablement mmh. qu'on puisse assurer nos partenaires commerciaux. Suivant. Oui, en pré-récolte. Suivant, suivant, je pense qu'on va essayer de voir. Mmh. Voilà. Voilà, donc c'est un peu comme ça que nous avons préparé, disons, la communication. À chaque étape, à chaque maillon, il y a des risques qui sont identifiés. On évalue les risques et des modules de gestion sont conseillés. Donc là, c'est des aspects vraiment pratiques. Par exemple, en pré-récolte, il y a des risques d'infestation de plantes hautes, mauvaises conditions d'hygiène. Et la commodité de gestion, ce que nous conseille, c'est d'éviter les cultures intercalaires de plantes hautes, Nettoyage des vergers aux alentours, donc l'assainissement des vergers. Faire également les travaux d'entretien. Tout cela, ça peut contribuer en tout cas à amoindrir les problèmes phytosanitaires. Si vous comparez les deux images, vous voyez un peu qu'à droite, je pense que c'est un verger qui est après propre. Et là, l'expérience a montré que la première méthode de lutte, c'est effectivement, disons, de respecter l'itinéraire technique. Ça, c'est une méthode de lutte, c'est agronomique, mais c'est la première méthode de lutte. Suivant, au niveau de, lors de la nuisance maturation également de la mangue, il y a la présence, le développement des larves, les mouches de fruits, sur arbres et, et, des, et, et même les fruits tombés hein, également. C'est des risques. Maintenant, comme mesure de gestion, c'est la formation des producteurs aux bonnes pratiques et la nécessité de l'assainissement, le ramassage et l'élimination, disons, des fruits mûrs tombés 
parce que l'expérience a montré que ce sont ces fruits qui sont effectivement le refuge ou bien le facteur qui multiplie un peu les mouches de fruits au niveau des, des vergers. Également, il y a le monitoring qui est à ce niveau conseil, c'est le paysage à paraphéromone qui a fait d'excellents résultats quand même en Afrique de l'Ouest, également des traitements phytosanitaires. Donc à tous les niveaux, on identifie le risque et on propose une mesure de gestion. Suivant. Récolte, transport également, il y a des risques. Même pour la récolte, il y a des techniques. Il y a de bonnes techniques de récolte que chaque, en tout cas, disons, producteur ou bien PME doit s'engager à faire de bonnes techniques de récolte. Parce que quelle que soit la qualité de la production, si la récolte n'est pas bien menée, ça va créer beaucoup d'écart à l'exportation. Et là, j'avoue qu'il y a beaucoup de sessions de formation qui ont été tenues, des sessions pratiques, pour un peu expliquer les techniques véritablement de récolte qui puissent garantir la qualité des produits. Suivant. Préparation de la récolte déjà. Présence de mangue tombée, piquée, verger mal entretenu. Tout ça, il y a des mesures de gestion. C'est l'assainissement du verger, la sélection des mangues de bonne qualité. Ça, il faut bien sélectionner. Les mangues piquées doivent être écartées. Mais faudrait-il que les récolteurs, les techniciens qui assurent la récolte puissent reconnaître une mangue piquée, ce qui n'est pas très évident. Et là, j'avoue que même pour les techniciens, quelquefois, pour la mangue bateau, par exemple, c'est très, très difficile, en tout cas, de détecter une piqûre récente. Si bien que c'est à l'arrivée du conteneur qu'effectivement, les inspecteurs, disons, du point d'entrée, peuvent là identifier très rapidement des mangues piquées. Mais au départ, ce n'est pas très évident. Si bien que des fois, on délivre des certificats phytosanitaires conformes, mais à l'arrivée, voilà, on détecte des mouches de fruits. Pour dire qu'on ne peut pas commercer avec 100% de conformité, ce n'est pas possible. Ça, ce n'est pas possible, je pense. Quelquefois, ce n'est pas parce qu'on vous a délivré un certificat phytosanitaire qu'effectivement, ça doit être conforme. Parce que quand même, euh, c'est un contrôle visuel. Hein? C'est un contrôle visuel, quelquefois des traitements de quarantaine, à l'eau chaude, par exemple. Mais en réalité, tant qu'au niveau du point d'entrée, il n'y a pas une autre mesure de quarantaine. Comme certains pays le font, les radiations, par exemple, c'est des choses qui peuvent rassurer. Mais si c'est juste le contrôle visuel, il peut arriver toujours qu'il y ait des notifications de non-conformité, malgré tous les efforts que les pays font pour mettre sur le marché des produits de bonne qualité. Également, la, la mise en cajot, ça, on est dans le conditionnement. Également, on identifie les risques et on donne des mesures, en tout cas de gestion, que les fermiers, les exportateurs sont obligés de respecter. Suivant, même le transport, un facteur de risque, on ne doit pas transporter le produit n'importe comment. Donc, parce qu'il y a des piqûres qui peuvent se faire en cours de route, donc il faudrait toujours prendre toutes les dispositions pour bien veiller aux techniques de transport de ces produits du verger, c'est-à-dire de la zone de production vers les stations de conditionnement, parce qu'il y a des risques à ce niveau également, et tout est identifié. Suivant. Réception, stockage, présence de mangues piquées dans les lots emportés des vergers. Donc à partir des vergers, les mangues, les produits peuvent venir avec déjà, disons, des piquets de mousse de fruits. Donc ils font un bon monitoring par paysage, même dans les stations de conditionnement. Il faut poser des pièges pour vérifier effectivement si l'organisme de quarantaine n'est pas présent. Entreposage et stockage couvert. Tout ça, c'est des mesures de gestion. Enlever les fruits infestés et les mettre au rebut. Tout ça, c'est des mesures de gestion que nous proposons et que les inspecteurs suivent au niveau de toutes les stations de conditionnement. Parce que pour le conditionnement de ces produits, disons stratégiques, il y a toujours la présence des inspecteurs fités au niveau de ces stations de conditionnement. Suivant, conditionnement, expédition également, c'est les bonnes pratiques qui sont partout en tout cas conseillées et les gens font autant que faire ce point, en tout cas de respecter ces bonnes pratiques. Quelquefois, il y a des écarts, mais on... Là, s'il y a des écarts vraiment notables, là, on n'hésite pas à écarter ceux qui sont responsables. Parce qu'une filière, quand même, doit fonctionner sur véritablement une base très claire pour un peu promouvoir ce commerce et surtout respecter les exigences de nos partenaires commerciaux. Suivant. Même au lavage, triage. Donc, c'est dans toute la ligne de conditionnement que des risques sont identifiés et des mesures de gestion proposées à tout le monde. Ici, c'est le lavage-triage, présence de mangues piquées dans les lots triés ou bien piquées des mangues par des mouches. Ce qu'on recommande, c'est la formation du personnel de la station à la reconnaissance de la mangue piquée. 
et enlever, enlever les fruits infestés exactement pour éviter véritablement de contamination. Suivant, jusqu'à l'emballage, palettisation, partout on identifie des risques et également des mesures de gestion sont posées. Et là, c'est un travail qui est supervisé par les inspecteurs et contrôleurs, contrôleurs phytosanitaires. Parce qu'en réalité, à un moment, en fait, lors de la campagne manque, en tout cas, généralement, c'est pratiquement tout le personnel de l'ONPV qui est mobilisé un peu pour, en tout cas, assurer la qualité phytosanitaire de ces produits. Suivant, stockage, chambre froide, tout ça, c'est contrôlé. Je pense que, en tout cas, sur toute la ligne, il y a de bonnes pratiques qui sont, disons, conseillées et supervisées par les inspecteurs phytosanitaires. Suivant, à l'expédition, développement de l'arbre. Là, c'est les risques, développement de l'arbre emporté de la station de conditionnement. Donc, maintenir la bonne température tout au long du voyage. S'il y a des piquets de mouches, lors du transfert des colis de la station au poste de sortie, bon, transport réfrigéré, quelquefois, ça peut atténuer. Transport en véhicule bien couvert, là également, c'est ce que nous conseillons en termes de mesures de gestion de ces risques identifiés. Suivant. Bon, là, je vais aller vite. Hein. De toute façon, c'est un peu quelques résultats obtenus, disons, en zone de production et conditionnement. Parce qu'avant, avant, disons, le classement, il y a toujours, disons, des missions d'investigation qui sont menées par les inspecteurs phytosanitaires pour un peu catégoriser, selon, évidemment, disons, la technicité, selon le respect des bonnes pratiques agricoles. Ça nous permet véritablement de bien classer, disons, les petites et moyennes entreprises et envisager un encadrement selon la catégorisation. Et cette année, nous avons utilisé les plateformes de collecte comme le Comango, qui a été développé par la Société financière internationale au Sénégal, et IFITO de la CIPV, que nous avons utilisé depuis, disons, décembre 2021, que nous avions commencé à émettre des IFITO. Et là, j'avoue que c'est avec l'appui de l'Alliance mondiale de facilitation des échanges et de la GIZ que nous tenons également à remercier. Suivant. Bon, là, voilà, c'est le nombre de rapports établis dans Comango pour les inspections, les bulletins d'alerte et de surveillance. Et même les 863 certificats phytosanitaires électroniques ont été délivrés au Sénégal durant la campagne Mangue. Ce qui est ça, c'est un peu ici, quoi. Suivant. Voilà, là, c'est les volumes de 2019 à 2022. Si vous remarquez bien, en 2022, il y a une baisse de 35 Et c'est en 2022 également où, où nous avons eu plus de notifications liées cette fois-ci surtout au dérèglement climatique qui a perturbé véritablement tous nos plans. Parce que 2017, depuis 2017, avec le dossier qu'on avait présenté à l'Union européenne, c'est vrai qu'on maîtrisait la situation. On ne dépassait pas 8 à 9 notifications par année, quelle que soit la situation. Mais avec le dérèglement climatique, évidemment, il y a eu retard dans la production, si bien que la période d'exploitation a coïncidé avec, en tout cas, une situation phytosanitaire très tendue. Bien vrai que beaucoup d'efforts ont été finalement faits par les inspecteurs et les opérateurs du secteur, mais n'empêche qu'on a eu beaucoup de notifications d'interception dues à ces mouches de fruits. D'ailleurs, c'est comme tous les pays pratiquement en Afrique de l'Ouest. Suivant. Encore, voilà, voilà ce que je disais, parce qu'en 2019, on était déjà à 7, 2029, notification, 2021-6, mais en 2022, on a eu 32 notifications. Ça, c'est l'effet du dérèglement climatique. Parce qu'en réalité, maintenant, d'ailleurs, c'est pourquoi on a reçu effectivement la lettre de l'Union européenne en vertu de la norme 13 de la CIPV, la notification de non-conformité. Et là, j'avoue qu'on a engagé déjà une réflexion avec toutes les parties prenantes pour identifier les causes profondes de ces notifications et envisager des mesures correctives. Et là, d'ici la prochaine campagne, certainement, l'Union européenne va recevoir un peu la lettre réponse du Sénégal. De même que les autres pays de la CDAO, les gens sont en train de travailler sur ce dossier pour véritablement rassurer davantage les partenaires et dégager des stratégies qui nous permettent quand même d'amenuiser, de, de réduire c'est non conformité sur le marché européen. Suivant. Voilà les défis. 
C'est prendre en compte les dérèglements climatiques dans l'évaluation et la gestion des fruits sanitaires, parce qu'il y a une coïncidence forte dynamique des populations de mouches à la pleine production export. Parce que d'habitude, pratiquement 70% de l'exploitation se faisait avant la pleine pluviométrie. Hein. Donc il y avait une esquive en fait. Mais cette année, malheureusement, la, bonne pluvi la pluviométrie a coïncidé effectivement avec la période d'exportation, en fait de pleine exportation. Si bien qu'on a eu ces problèmes, mais bon, avec la réflexion qui est en train d'être menée au Sénégal, je sais que des mesures collectives seront identifiées pour véritablement nous repositionner sur ce marché. Et d'ailleurs, c'est valable également pour les autres pays hein, de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, pratiquement. Donc nous allons essayer de consolider l'approche systémique pour garantir la, produit, de, la qualité des produits en période de forte infestation, ou bien arrêter les campagnes très tôt pour ne pas avoir beaucoup de notifications. De toute façon, on verra le schéma qu'il faudra faire. Voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ndiaye. I now invite Dr. Mary Lucy Oronje, SPS scientist of the Center of Agriculture and Bioscience International, CABI, to present on databases on, and tools for past risk assessment, capacity development opportunities for countries. Dr. Oronje, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, make a presentation on database and tools for pest risk assessment and highlighting some of the capacity development opportunities that we have identified along the way. Uh, my name is uh, Mary Lucy Ronje, scientist SPS at CABI. I'm pr making this presentation today. However, uh, there are a number of my colleagues that are behind me in terms of preparation for this particular uh, presentation. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to CABI, uh, Center for Agriculture and Biosciences International. CABI is an intergovernmental, non-profit, not-for-profit organization that uh, is involved in uh, uh, areas of food safety and nutrition security, climate change and biodiversity, gender and youth and also economic development. We have a number of areas of expertise, including uh, crop health, uh, development communication and extension, digital development uh, and invasive species management, uh, publishing uh, and value chains and trade. Today, I will make a presentation on CABI decision support tools uh, for risk, pest risk assessment and also comment on some of the challenges we've identified as a result of deploying some of these tools. Next slide. So one of the uh, uh, tools that I want to highlight is the Crop Protection Compendium. I'm sure you've heard a lot about this uh, even in today's presentation. And uh, this particular Crop Protection Compendium, uh, CPC as it's well known, is quite a robust database uh, with uh, uh, data sheets on plant health, including uh, crop pests, uh, their distribution, and also management. And uh, this is the ma main uh, database that drives some of the uh, uh, tools that I'm going to highlight today for supporting uh, pest risk uh, analysis. Next slide. So, uh, the, the second uh, database I want to highlight is the horizon scanning tool. Uh, I think uh, one presenter from DEFRA mentioned about the UK <laughs> pest risk uh, register. And uh, this also tool uh, that we've developed uh, looking at some of the uh, practices by the DEFRA. And this is uh, uh, targeting the risk assessors and plant protection officers. This tool enables the uh, risk assessors to be able to identify some of their uh, invasive pests, not present in their countries, but with likelihood uh, of uh, getting introduction into their countries. It's a very short uh, 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 exercise that uh, we are encouraging the NPPOs to undertake, and it really looks at the, the PRA process, the risk of uh, entry uh, establishment spread, and also impact. So it's a way to prioritize some of the species for uh, pest-initiated PRAs in, in the region. Next slide. The other tool is uh, uh, a, a CABI PRA tool, and this uh, tool uh, is uh, targeted again at risk assessors for in-depth uh, uh, risk analysis. 
uh, either you can in initiate uh, a PRA uh, by pathway or by pest in, in the tool and uh, also generate plant commodity pest list, uh, an, an exercise that is normally quite uh, a task for risk analysts, and uh, or proceed on to do the pest categorization and in-depth analysis. Uh, all these tools are, are aligned to the ISPMs, for instance, ISPM 2 and 11 for risk a assessment. So well, the beauty of this particular tool is uh, uh, risk assessors can be able to uh, work as a team and we often see this uh, at the NPPO level where a number of team members are involved in the PRA. So uh, currently we have undertaken uh, a number of uh, uh, capacity building in the use of the tool but also in, in, the, in the PRA and uh, now we uh, have a gratis uh, uh, subscription available for most NPPOs of around 117 uh, lower and middle uh, uh, income countries, including especially for Africa. Next slide. So I mentioned about the PRA trainings that we've undertaken, both commodity and pest initiated PRAs. And uh, currently we have had in 2021 about 140 uh, participants uh, undertaking uh, a number of uh, 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 risk analysis uh, trainings, but on, on that, on built on that, on how to use this particular databases for decision support. In 2022, this is this year, we've also trained about 180 uh, specialists on, on pest risk analysis and also on, on, on the use of these uh, uh, decision support tools. We also still going on with this in 2023, and your support uh, is also uh, quite important in uh, ensuring that uh, these tools uh, can be used to support uh, the, the PRA process. Next slide. What we are seeing uh, is in most of the countries where we've undertaken these uh, uh, trainings, we are seeing a, a very high number of use of, of this uh, uh, decision support tool, especially the CPC and the PRA uh, a tool. And you can see from this uh, 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 particular slide how the increase has been uh, in terms of individual users, but also in terms of country who are uh, using these tools. Uh, what some of the leading countries are actually in Africa, which is uh, quite a good uh, because then uh, we are seeing that uh, capacity being built and the tools being used. However, I want to highlight here that uh, training on PR is just one process. What happens after that is, is uh, also very uh, critical, especially on the, the skills to uh, employ risk-based uh, approaches in terms of uh, risk management. Um, especially when uh, the, it is to imp uh, for import control but also facilitation of trade. So also uh, one issue that I want to highlight here is that we like to see the joined up activities that uh, uh, some of these trainings stimulate activities that are important. Uh, for instance, we've seen in a number of countries where we've uh, undertaken uh, capacity building uh, that uh, after the use of horizon scanning tool and identification of risks, we've seen uh, uh, pest risk analysis in terms of pest initiated PRAs being undertaken and also surveillance is being undertaken. So some of these uh, good practices we have noted from West Africa in Ghana to uh, the Southern Africa region in Zambia, Kenya included and recently in Uganda. And especially so for, for key uh, pests uh, that are important for food uh, security but also trade like the banana banchitop, uh, banchitop virus and uh, uh, folk tr4. So these are good practices that we'd like to highlight and also uh, ensure that is adopted in other countries. However, in the next slide, the number of challenges that we have identified and one of it is uh, of course lack of uh, national databases in terms of pest lists but also in terms of previous PRAs that are undertaken. Uh, they are also uh, disjointed uh, uh, the database that uh, uh, exists so we'd like to uh, probably support countries to be able to put this uh, together and have uh, some national uh, databases in terms of uh, national pest list. Also, capacity to do uh, with uh, assessing likelihood of pest establishment using uh, different tools like Climax and Bioclaim, this capacity, capacity is also lacking. 
We uh, also identified the need to strengthen PRA teams in some countries. Uh, this is uh, very ad hoc and uh, in some non-existence. And I think we've, ha we've uh, had about uh, 80 people um, in US dedicated to PRA. I think that's something that is not uh, available in most African countries. Also in terms of uh, extending the scope, to biological control risk assessment and living uh, uh, modified organisms introduction risk assessment. These are some of the areas we have seen some weaknesses. Next slide. So the future focus, for instance, we'd like to expand uh, utilization of some of these uh, uh, decision support tools like the horizon scanning uh, PRA tools, but also undertake uh, translations. Uh, for instance, French is a priority for some of our tools like the PRA and uh, enhance uh, regional uh, approaches in terms of risk assessment and activities that uh, uh, should come uh, after these uh, PRAs like surveillances and also uh, coming up with some uh, 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 SOPs for inspections, for instance. And of course, addressing climate change uh, as part of the horizon scanning, but also uh, pest risk analysis. Uh, we also want to recommend that in addition to the IPPC PRA, PRA self-study, that uh, some of these support tools be, uh, uh, be enhanced in terms of uh, their use for users. Next slide. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for listening and also thank uh, our development partners, uh, USDA, including STDF. And just to mention that STDF is supporting us in one of the regional programs that we are uh, including uh, ESC in terms of uh, building capacity for market access for scale insects uh, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orongje. The floor is now open for questions related to the last two presentations in session four. Are there any questions or comments? I see the flag of... Uh, Zambia, Zambia, you have the floor. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the flag is from Kenya. I want to thank the Sorry. presenters for the, uh, for the quite informative presentations. Uh, there are many challenges that have been highlighted, but uh, one I think that needs more emphasis is the issue of uh, duration taken for the pest risk analysis. And sometimes the challenges we have is that in trying to access markets, it takes a very long time, sometimes up to 10 years or more. And uh, we would hope that uh, as WTO countries, we can try to facilitate trade. Then maybe just to mention in terms of Africa, uh, PRAs have also been used to facilitate trade within uh, Africa. I can mention too, the East African community has undertaken PRAs uh, for maize, beans, and rice. And this is to facilitate the trade within the three countries. And they have also operationalized standard operating procedures just to make it too easy to move uh, uh, produce and commodities from one country to another. Then the other one is uh, for Comesa. Uh, some few years ago, there was an initiative by Comesa, uh, SADC, and uh, other countries to um, to enable countries uh, move seed. And therefore, regulations were established. That is the Comesa seed harmonization. Uh, regulations are in place for about 11 or 12 commodities. And therefore, I can say that uh, pest risk analysis has been key in the facilitation of trade. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kenya, for your comment. Are there any questions? Uh, STDF? Thank you, Chair, floor. and apologies, no flag. Um, thank you. My name is Roshan Khan. I am part of the Standards and Trade Development Facility. I'd just like to build on um, Dr. Mary Lucy's uh, presentation. She presented on behalf of the CABI. And um, I'm pleased to share that we recently completed a project in Zambia with their 
phytosanitary uh, inspection service where we have also supported building capacity for PRA. Obviously, PRA is the cornerstone, uh, cornerstone for um, a lot of work that we do with different NPPOs. Um, so um, I, I welcome you to take a look at this project. Uh, specifically, information is available on our website. And interestingly, as Mary Lucy referred to, we are now starting a new project from January of next year with Kabi that will involve KFIS, uh, Kenya, um, Ugan the NPPOs of Uganda, and um, Burundi to build their capacity specifically for PRA. Um, and should anybody be interested to find out more about this project, please feel free to reach out to the SDDF Secretariat or uh, visit our website. Um, several speakers today also made a reference to systems approach. And I'm pleased to share with you that working closely with the IPPC Secretariat, we completed a project on rolling out decision support tools which help countries actually map out the different control points uh, for systems approach. So we had a bit of a twinning approach uh, under this project. Uh, uh, NPPOs like South Africa who have had fair success in implementing systems approach were paired up with staff from other NPPOs present in the region to learn from them and to apply the different tools that they have to, uh, for systems approach. And this is a completed project and a detailed, uh, detailed results and impact are also available on our um, website. I think uh, my point is that we have, um, working in the area of phytosanitary capacity building, this is something that is continues to be a high demand, uh, regardless of the, the continent or the context we work in. And we have supported several projects in this area, so we would, should there be interest, uh, please feel free to reach out to us or visit our website. Thank you. Thank you, the STDF, and I see the flag of European Union. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I have a, a curiosity question to, to Kavi. How do you fill your database? Do you, do you depend from NPPOs to report on, on their surveillance and monitoring, or do you actively also scan the literature, or how do you collect your information, which, which is then in, in the Kavi database? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we actively use the uh, published uh, literature to be able to generate the information that goes into the database. However, in case it's a new pass, for instance, uh, when we had uh, uh, fallen worm and we need to create uh, information, we can commission experts to develop that. And using the NPPO reports, we update the information. The, uh, most of the uh, information comes from published, uh, uh, reviewed uh, uh, literature that uh, we uh, have a team that uh, uh, looks for that information and updates uh, either the, the crops uh, or the weeds or the pests uh, information that's on our database. There is also an opportunity for NPPO to reach out to us to be able to, to uh, review, uh, for instance, the uh, distribution uh, so that then we, we can either uh, add or, 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 or remove some of the distribution points for the uh, pest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orunje. Are there any questions or comments? I would like to take this opportunity to, to remind members that actually in our formal... Sorry? Zambia? Uh, you have the floor. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Chair. I think uh, for us, um, it's just to appreciate um, the support that um, we've been receiving. Um, of course, starting with, uh, I think, Kabi from um, the points that they've uh, highlighted, uh, we've been working very, very closely with uh, Kabi in the area of um, uh, capacity building uh, for pest risk um, analysis, our team uh, back home. Uh, indeed, uh, the team, the way it is today and the way it was before, I think there's a very big uh, difference, especially with the various tools that uh, Kabi has um, introduced. I think it has really improved um, 
the way we undertake our pest risk analysis. But also to appreciate um, the sentiments uh, from the STDF concerning uh, the project that uh, we've been uh, implementing um, um, uh, um, back home, which is, uh, of course, supported by the STDF and uh, uh, the EIF. Indeed, um, I think the support has been um, uh, massive. It has seen, um, um, it has seen us um, come up with, uh, for instance, a new um, plant health bill, uh, which, will repla which will repeal and replace uh, the old act that we've been using, which, of course, has a lot of uh, uh, gaps here and there. From that process, from that support that we've been given, we've been able to do that, and the process um, has carried on uh, from there. Other than that, I must say we've been able to uh, procure equipment um, um, that we're using for, of course, uh, inspections, uh, trainings, vast trainings, uh, risk-based uh, uh, related trainings. Also, we've had engagements uh, within the, um, the, the SADC region where we've been looking at strategies on how we can um, um, uh, conduct uh, or come up, come up with a strategies of uh, uh, conducting um, um, uh, more like re regional-based uh, surveillance uh, uh, strategies. So just to say uh, thank you so much for that um, uh, support that we received. Uh, last but not the least, of course, you know that Zamb Zambia championed um, uh, the International Day of Plant Health. So allow me, Chair, to take this opportuni opportunity to just um, thank the NPPOs, various NPPOs, um, the IPPC, international organizations, and many more others, which are too many to, uh, to mention. Indeed, we did uh, champion uh, the cause of the International Day of Plant Health, which of course was declared, and that's the 12th of uh, May. Further on, just to thank um, um, the opportunity that was given or invitations uh, that was uh, sent to our Honorable Minister of Our Culture to give uh, the close remarks at the um, International Day of, uh, sorry, International Plant Health Convention that was held in uh, London. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Zambia, for the comment. And I would like to take this opportunity to remind uh, the participants of today that uh, in our formal meeting, there is an agenda item, technical assistance and cooperation. I think today uh, we have a lot of information which is valuable to be shared, perhaps can be shared in, that, in, in, the, informal, uh, in the formal meeting to have more members to be aware. Thank you. So with this, uh, we conclude session four. In relation to practical experiences in the application of pest risk management in trade, I would like to thank the speakers for the inform information provided. Our last session for this event will be a panel discussion where panelists will exchange experiences and discuss the challenges, opportunities, and best practices related to pest risk identification, assessment, and management, as well as explore the need for further IPPC guidance. For this panel discussion, we have three panelists whom you are familiar with from previous session. May I ask the speakers to press the raised hand button. You are kindly requested, requested to keep your video turned on throughout this session but please keep your microphone on mute. Only turn on your microphone when the moderator has given you the floor. Our panel today is composed of Ms. Lillian Daisy Ibanez Olat, head of the Pest Risk and Analysis Section, Plant Quarantine Sub-Department of the Agricultural, Forestry, and Seed Protection Division of Chile's Agricultural and Like Livestock Service. Dr. David Dale, Principal Scientific Analyst of the Biosecurity Plant and the Science Services Division of the Australian Government Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And Mr. Richard Titi Prasert, Advisor at the National Bureau of Agriculture, Commodity and Food Standards of Thailand. This panel discussion will be moderated by Dr. Osama El-Lisi, IPPC Secretariat, 
who is present in the room and has joined us on the podium. Welcome, Dr. Elisi. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for such a very rich, productive discussion today. Uh, certainly, I have the pleasure and honor to uh, work with uh, uh, the panelists this afternoon to go over some aspects of um, what should we do more of, less of, um, uh, some things that maybe we need to change to be as productive as possible. Um, but I wanted to begin by um, thanking uh, the SPS um, Secretariat for putting a really nice agenda together and uh, such uh, very eloquent speakers uh, with vast knowledge and expertise that they share with us this afternoon. I know it's been a very long day for everyone, so we'll try to get to the point and, and hopefully we can summarize the session um, as, as effectively as possible. I want to reflect on some things um, that we talked about this afternoon. As the chair uh, mentioned, I'm the IPPC secretary. I've been in my position for about seven months, so I'm kind of fairly new. However, uh, prior to becoming a secretary, I was the head of the MPPO of the United States for almost 12 years. So I'm not really new to the IPPC world. And with that in mind, um, I reflect a little bit on some of the information provided today. Here's what I walk away with, and I hope you walk away with the same kind of um, salient points. The uh, question is, do we have very clear standards that are designed to safeguard agriculture and facilitate safe trade? I think the answer is yes, based on the discussion we had here today. Do we have a good understanding as to how those standards should and are implemented based on the many presentations that we um, heard today? Yes, there is a clear understanding and, and um, high level of command of how the standards are being, are being implemented, understood and implemented, okay? Uh, do we have enough standards? Uh, obviously, this morning uh, was reported that we have 46 standards already, covering all the way from pest risk analysis to pest mitigation to even eradication of pests once they found, surveillance, right, diagnostics, and so on and so forth. Okay. So do we have other tools such as diagnostic protocols? Yes, 44 of them, uh, or 31 of them. Do we have enough quarantine treatments? There's never enough quarantine treatments, as we all know, because things are changing all the time, but we do have 44 mm -hmm. approved quarantine treatments. Okay, so this is, you know, very positive side of the equation. But also here this morning that invasive pests continue to destroy up to 40% of agriculture crops, including food crops, each year. This is an average. In some parts of the world, that number is much higher. We also heard this morning that the economic impact of invasive pests is about $220 billion annually. Okay, hear that. I think somebody touched on uh, climate change and what climate change is doing in terms of increasing pest um, expansion as well. Um, while also, at the same time, the number of people that are facing hunger continues to increase. 828 million people that are hungry today as we speak. So that's the other side of the equation. So on one hand, we have the standards. We know how to implement the standards. We know how to mitigate um, pest risks. 
But on the other hand, we have a lot of challenges. Hence, the discussion here and beyond. What do we need to do together, collectively, to be more efficient, more effective, deal with these pests in the most effective, most efficient, most innovative way? So we can see better results, quite frankly, out there. So um, that's, that's what I'm walking away with. And, and I hope the conversation this afternoon uh, may um, shed some light as to where we go from here. So with that, uh, we've kind of put together a few questions for uh, my colleagues, the panelists. And the first question, so, you know, we'll ask each of them that question. The question is, based on what we've heard today, what is the one thing that you could be easily improved in the process of pest risk identification, assessment, and management? The one thing that you can think of that could improve the process. So let's go ahead and start with Lillian first, and then go to David, and then to Wichar. So Lillian, the floor is yours. Eh, muchas gracias, Presidente. Eh, creo que en las presentaciones y en varias de las presentaciones de todos los expositores se han identificado eh, varias formas de hacer mejoras en todo lo que es el proceso de evaluación de riesgo. Eh, si tuviéramos que identificar aquellas formas que son más fáciles de implementar, creo que deberíamos eh, ver la forma de mejorar los accesos a la información. La información es eh, fundamental para poder realizar una buena evaluación de riesgo y que ésta sea lo menos eh, compleja posible. Hay eh, accesos libres a bases de datos donde se pueden acceder sin pago y que están eh, disponibles para poder lograr eh, una, una, buena, una buena evaluación. Eh, creo que, eh, por ejemplo, acá también se, fue, se mencionó eh, el acceso al CAVI, que es una muy buena, muy buena herramienta, sin embargo, eh, por lo menos hasta donde yo, la, el conocimiento que tengo es pagada, nosotros pagamos por eso. Entonces, eh, también hay eh, información relevante como es... Eh, la que entregan los países exportadores para poder iniciar el proceso de evaluación. Y ahí creo que podemos apuntar en que queremos agilizar este, esta evaluación mientras el país entregue mejor información. Eh, el proceso puede ser más eficaz. ¿Y mejor información en qué sentido? En apuntar a lo que son las plagas que pueden estar asociadas al producto y más que nada también eh, ver eh, la asociación con el hospedante. Eh, eso creo que puede, que puede ayudar a simplificar eh, el, el proceso de, de evaluación. Junto con las otras cosas que, que mencioné también en la presentación, que son como el fortalecimiento de los recursos humanos, la planificación creo que es importante, que muchas veces no se visualiza como una buena forma o puede eh, pensarse que genera más demora, sin embargo, a mediano o largo plazo puede mejorar el, el, el proceso. Eh, las consultas, el apoyo como organizaciones regionales también puede eh, mejorar. Nosotros como organización regional que yo también lo mencioné en la presentación, como COSAVE, tenemos este apoyo de grupos técnicos que pueden hacer que se identifiquen eh, plagas que están, siendo, que están causando daño en otras regiones y podamos tener eh, mejores tiempos de respuesta eh, en relación a, a poder hacer la evaluación, compartirla, incluirla en nuestros listados de plagas cuarentenarias de cada país incluirla en nuestros listados de plagas regionales. Eso creo que también se puede mejorar, apuntar a mejorar eh, la disponibilidad de la información. La CIPF tiene información sobre los listados de plagas cuarentenarias de cada país. Sin embargo, muchas veces no está muy actualizado. 
si tuviéramos acceso a esos listados, también la evaluación se simplifica. Eso, eso podría yo eh, indicar. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, David? Thank you very much, uh, Osama. Um, I, I guess I would approach this from a slightly different angle, and, and I think that um, a, key, a key step forward would be to provide A key step forward is to provide cheap and easy to David, I'm sorry. Interpretive. Yes, we're getting a message that the quality of the sound is not as clear. Yes, I'm sorry. So, David, maybe if you can get as close as possible to the computer and, and try to speak slowly, maybe. Thank you. And I'm getting uh, echo feedback as well. So, uh, um, I'll keep it short. I think cheap and easily deployed field testing equipment that can readily differentiate pests in the field lamp assays, um, mobile phone apps, and tests that can potentially distinguish um, resistant uh, strains um, of pests using molecular techniques that allow um, um, effective control measures to be applied rapidly Um, at the at the point where they need it. Thank you. Th thank you very much, David. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, now we go to uh, Mr. Witcher. Uh, thank you, musicians. Um, my view on this. You're asking for one thing that could be easily improved in the process of pressing and integration. I'm thinking of the database. I think database is the most important uh, for the successful of the pressing analysis uh, assessment. I think uh, what CAPI has been done is good. I think if we have extend the the database uh, of more easily to access for the countries like uh, Thailand or other uh, developing countries, it should be useful. And I think it's mostly very easy uh, to improve in the short term period. Uh, I think that is, it would, that is my, uh, my view on this. A question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's go to another question. And the next question is to um, Lillian. As an importer, mostly, of course you're an exporter too, but from an importing uh, perspective, if you could request one thing from an exporting member, what would that be? What is the one thing that would you, requ you would request from an exporting country to facilitate for a, a successful engagement? Creo que voy a ser un poco majadera en repetir lo de la información. Creo que si la información es completa, actualizada, pertinente la información que entrega el país exportador puede ser mucho más eh, simple y menos compleja la eh, evaluación de riesgos. Como analista eh, de riesgo, yo además de ser la, la jefa de la unidad de análisis de riesgo del Servicio Agrícola y Ganadero de Chile, 
soy analista de riesgo. Empecé así y sigo siendo, haciendo análisis y ojalá nunca lo, lo deje, porque eso es lo que, lo que me gusta más hacer. Eh, cuando me enfrento a, a hacer una evaluación de riesgo y cuento con la información del país eh, como base, que me, que me la entrega como base, donde hay una adecuada identificación de los peligros, es decir, una adecuada identificación de las plagas que pueden estar asociadas al producto, es mucho más simple realizar la evaluación y establecer las medidas de manejo. Entonces, creo que eh, si pudiera pedirle una sola cosa al país exportador, sería, y que también quizás como, como CIPF se puede trabajar en aquello, en entregar los lineamientos del dossier que tiene que entregar el país exportador para que el país importador realice la evaluación de riesgo. Hay información que es, super, es fundamental para poder realizar la evaluación y eh, simplifica todo el proceso. Eso sería. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next question goes to uh, Witcher. Now that you heard from Lillian as an importer, the number one thing that you would ask for is high quality uh, and timely information. So uh, as an exporter, how would you, um, do you agree, disagree? How would you react to this comment about the quality of information? Um. As an exporting country, what would we, I mean, Thailand, looking forward uh, uh, to react uh, is the requirement of the uh, requirement of the importing country required. There are so many. There are so many, 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 many things we as an exporting country uh, have to comply with. Uh, I think one thing is the, the time uh, for evalu evalu evaluating or the time to time for the, I mean, it should be a definite time Uh, as a exporting country, we would like to to have a clear, definite time for pastry uh, analysis procedures. Uh, as I have mentioned, the it takes a long time for negotiation between the importing country and ex exporting country. Um, delay of the negotiation or delay of the establishment of the agreement or agree term for the uh, between exporting country and, and importing country is very important. So what I, 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 I would like to react is the, as an exporting country would like to, to to see a, a definite time frame for the Patrix analysis. I'm sorry, which uh, I think you've uh, accidentally muted yourself. Okay, that's, that's, you're good now. Go ahead, please. Okay, sorry, we, there are technical problems. Um, What I'm thinking as in exporting country is we would like to see a time frame for the pace risk analysis. Um, if it possible, I would like to request the importing country uh, to set and a Different time in carrying out the pacific analysis for the 
products from Thailand. I think that is the that is the one thing uh, I would like to react from the exporting country perspective. That all, share. Thank you. Th thank you very much, which are and and I I have to ask you a follow up, not to put you in a hot seat or anything, but are you are you able? to provide the exporting country with some sort of a time frame uh, by which you are able to complete the pest risk assessment? I think we are, I think we we can uh, we can negotiate for the time frame. Uh, so we can discuss with the uh, as a uh, we can discuss uh, for the time for case week analysis. Why not? I think we can do. You don't know. Perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. I think um, that will be a, a good step in the right direction. And, and so I appreciate you making that offer. Um, so thank you. Uh, Lillian, were you trying to say something? Sí, quería agregar que, bueno, Chile también es un país exportador. Somos importadores y exportadores. Y en ese sentido estaría de acuerdo con, con fijar plazos, pero también quisiera eh, aclarar que a veces la evaluación de riesgo se realiza y la demora se produce en la negociación bilateral entre los países para poder llegar a un acuerdo entre la aplicación de los requisitos. Entonces, eh, los plazos que se pueden mejorar en, con relación a la planificación que yo les mencionaba, En muchas veces se le se le asignan se le se le asignan a, a lo que es la evaluación de riesgo pero yo les hablo desde el punto de vista de la experiencia desde Chile quizás lo que se demora es la parte posterior que es la fijación de las medidas de manejo del riesgo eh, nosotros también tenemos eh, demoras como país exportador eh, muchas veces porque queremos que eh, abrir mercado y queremos que se nos fijen nuestros requisitos, pero esa es la demora que es lo que eh, tiene plazos a veces muy indefinidos. Y creo que es, es, a, es a eso lo que se refieren. Va más allá de la evaluación de riesgo. Pero la evaluación de riesgo puede ser, puede tener un plazo de, no sé, dos, cinco, seis meses, pero la demora es posterior, cuando se fijan las medidas. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Lillian. So let me bring uh, David into the conversation. So David, your reaction to some of the comments about, um, from the importer perspective, exporter perspective, quality of information, time frame, et cetera. So give us your thoughts. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I know uh, I'm not sure whether people uh, in the room are aware that we have had a clue what some of these questions would be. But um, Dr. Lissy, if I can go back to where you started from to say, I think um, you, gave, you gave a very good overview of things that we have available. And I think what we need to be looking at is better using the protocols and that we already have. Now, as it happens, I uh, independently came up with the same answer that Lillian did in terms of what uh, an importing country requires. And um, from the perspective of PRA preparation, detailed and accurate pest lists. And I would go a little bit further and say detailed and accurate 
descriptions from the NPPOs of production practices in the country where the uh, commodity is produced, because that has a material effect um, on um, the pathway and the risk factors that can be that are associated with that pathway as well. And um, in our experience in Australia, um, the quality of material provided is uh, very uneven. Sometimes it's very good, and sometimes it's really quite fragmentary and very hard to interpret. So. Um, I totally agree with Lillian there um, about the quality of information. Um, as an exporter, I'd say move to one thing I would um, bring to attention is using some of the uh, standards and the agreed phytosanitary treatments that we have available. Under ISPM 28, there's a, a significant number of phytosanitary uh, treatments that are agreed. It's uh, somewhere around 32 or thereabouts. Um, and it seems that once countries have actually, importing countries, so now I'm speaking as an exporter, once importing countries have agreed to those, along with the exporting countries, um, it seems to me that market access requests from exporting countries that proposed to apply those treatments and show that they can, um, those requests should then be um, accepted and actioned without undue delay. It wouldn't seem that they really need very much further consideration because all of that consideration has already been done um, and really should be pretty much uh, you know, cut and dried, quite straightforward to roll out. So, um, uh, they would, that would be my wish list. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. I have two more questions and it will be done. Okay. So the, uh, the first question is based on your country's experience and listening to some of the comments from the private sector today. Um, how do you go about addressing the main challenges that the, the private sector um, uh, faces uh, and, and how can you help them to facilitate trade in general? Uh, let's go with uh, Lillian first. Primero que todo, habría que hacer una identificación de los desafíos, bueno, de acuerdo a lo que se, se ha indicado acá en las presentaciones, hay desafíos globales, mundiales, como son la crisis climática, la, la, el déficit hídrico, hasta el déficit de mano de obra, eh, pero en, si lo llevamos al ámbito específico de las plagas, eh, nuestros principales desafíos son... Eh, son el movimiento de plagas a través de, de envíos comerciales o a través de pasajeros, eh, el, el uso sustentable, la disminución de, de, lo, de los pesticidas y todo siempre manteniendo el, el mismo nivel de control. Creo que una forma simple eh, de poder mejorar eso, ese desafío con el sector privado es la comunicación del riesgo. Que se, a veces se piensa que es una etapa final, pero es una etapa transversal que debe ser desde el inicio de la evaluación de riesgo hasta, esta, hasta el final, hasta que se establecen las medidas. Nos, nuestra experiencia nos indica que cuando no hemos comunicado con el sector privado y le hemos indicado eh, qué vamos a hacer y el por qué, eh, se entiende mucho mejor el, por, el establecimiento de medidas fitosanitarias y en final eh, es eh, indicarles también que es para la protección del mismo sector, o sea, nosotros estamos eh, trabajando para prevenir la introducción de nuevas plagas y la prevención es el control más barato entonces si prevenimos también eh, fortalecemos el, el sector eh, productivo para evitar que ingresen nuevas plagas y hacer al sector más competitivo 
frente a esta, la, esta ausencia de plagas que están, que están causando daño e impacto mundial. Eso sería. Thank you so much, Lillian. Uh, let's go to Wichar. What um, you want to share your thoughts with us regarding this question? Um, working with the private sector. Thank you, Chair. Based on the Thailand experience, we I think that. The one of the most important thing to, to assist the uh, private sector is, um, in general, the, the private sector, they are lacking of understanding how important the pest risk analysis, how important uh, the rules and procedures set out by the international organization is very important and has an impact on the on, on international trade. So I think a communication with the private sector, uh, building up the capacity building uh, for the private sector to understand the Patrix analysis. And secondly, I think um, we should set up the mechanism or the, 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 the process uh, to let the uh, private sector to participate on the decision making uh, um, on international trade. Uh, in Thailand, we have the mechanism uh, as a, we set up the a committee or subcommittee on the, let's say the uh, SPS agreement or the TBT under the WTO. So we invited uh, the private sector to join a committee and to discuss among the authority and the private sector and come to the conclusion, I mean, to make decision uh, uh, how to proceed with the uh, international trade or to facilitate trade uh, as a importing and exporting country uh, in the same uh, time. There are two ways communication, and that is the the mechanism we have already uh, uh, make it possible to facilitate it and to assist the 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 private sector. One is the capacity building or knowledge or understanding of the Pacific analysis. How important is this impact on the international trade? And to uh, invite them to participate on the solution making mechanism uh, on the pace freak analysis or in, to facilitate trade. I think that all I would like to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Witcher. Okay, let's go to uh, Dr. Dale. What, what would you like to share with us? Thank you, Luke. My experience of the private sector is that uh, an overriding factor of interest to them is the speed of movement in and out of the country, and whether that's export or import, and um, whether they're highly perishable goods such as cut flowers, or whether they're bricks and slate tiles that would last forever. The uh, private sector are quite understandably want to move them quickly. Now, of course, um, pest risk and you know pest management is always going to be there. So, a way I think of assisting the private sector is to make sure that the that there are clear export and import conditions uh, set out and readily available for them to to uh, access. Um, potentially uh, looking at things that we haven't really got into today, like in fighter declarations, so the documentation can be uh, appointed and where, uh, when it comes to actually doing the assessments uh, at the docks and inspections and so on, that um, 
paperwork delays don't hold them up. So that's not really a pest risk uh, um, uh, factor, I understand, um, but I think that uh, actually making sure the inspection process is in and out goes smoothly um, will be a big help to the private sector while still allowing us to maintain um, safe inward and outward trade. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, okay, now to the last question. Um, and and to, um, again, to the three of you, uh, looking ahead, uh, is there anything that WTO or the IPPC uh, could do to help improve the process, the entire process of, of pest risk identification, assessment, as well as mitigation? What are the one or two things that you think WTO or IPPC can do to help uh, with this process? So let's start with uh, Lillian and then Witcher and then David. Lillian, the floor is yours. Creo que una de las eh, cosas que podría impulsar la CPF serían eh, directrices para la evaluación de riesgo en base al uso propuesto. Eh, yo sé que esto ya se menciona en los lineamientos que da la CIPF en la NIF 11 de evaluación de riesgo, también lo hace la NIF 32 de eh, categorías de riesgo. Sin embargo, creo que eh, sería bueno a, eh, eh, dar los lineamientos para, para que las medidas de manejo se establecieran en base al riesgo y no en, eh, no en base al peligro. Por ejemplo, lo que sucede con eh, patógenos o que están asociados a material de consumo. Eso debería tener un riesgo menor, por lo tanto, deberían tener otras medidas de manejo. También eh, sería eh, relevante la unificación de criterios en cuanto a la evaluación de plagas de interés mundial, siguiendo, siguiendo una guía estandarizada. Podría facilitar la gestión del riesgo en algunos casos o también el desarrollo y trabajo conjunto en cuanto a la evaluación taxonómica de fitoplasma y otras plagas que son eh, conflictivas taxonómicamente para eh, lograr una mejor unificación, eh, regulación de las mismas. Eso es. Gracias. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Witcher? Um, this is very difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I personally don't know exactly <laughs> uh, that what the WTO or IPBC could do to have improved. But I'm thinking of the um, if possible, I would like to see the WTO and the IPPC uh, increasing more exchange of information. I mean, uh, more frequently uh, sharing the information. That is the the most important thing uh, the the WTO or the IPPC could do to improve the. Uh, process of pastry identification. That's all I, I would like to say. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Witcher. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and I agree with my colleague, uh, Dr. Alyssa, you've saved up one of the hardest ones for last, so thank you for that. Um, if I could, uh, if I could just do uh, one magic thing. I would I would get the uh, IPPC to set up a red alert system for emerging um, viruses, seedborne viruses of field crops. And tomatoes are one of the biggest crops grown around the world in huge volumes. And a couple of viruses, tomato model mosaic virus and tomato brown rugate root virus had basically spread through seeds before the world really actually realised that they had emerged. Now, um, 
on. We, we, we all picked it up for our uh, publications in journals and so on. If there was a red alert system that said there's uh, something, something in these crops, be very careful. Um, don't spread them around until we actually know what uh, we've got here. We could potentially have saved uh, an awful lot of damage around the world. So, um, as an off the cuff response, uh, thank you. I'd say uh, a, a red alert system will see more viruses. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, David. And, and I wanted to, uh, in conclusion, uh, I want to thank all three of you, uh, Lillian, uh, David, and, and Witcher, for your insight, your patience, and um, your, your, um, your expert um, knowledge, and for willing to share this information with us uh, readily here in, um, in the session. So again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, we'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Dr. Elisi, and all the panelists for the discussion. I, I want to express my special thanks to Dr. Dale from Australia because it's almost 4 a.m. in Australia and it's almost midnight in Thailand. So thank Dr. Mr. Richard as well, and of course Lillian. Thank you, and uh, we have reached the end of the semantic session and have heard very interesting and informal, informative discussions and presentations from members. International inter, in, intergovernmental uh, organizations and industrial representatives. I trust that the semantic session has provided insight on the relevant international standards, as well as the challenges, opportunities, and best practices in pest risk identification, assessment, and management. Let me thank all of the speakers for their presentations and interventions today on these important topics. Uh, as you know, we had some technical problems at the beginning of the session, so I have to express my sincere appreciation to interpreters. For, thanks for your flexibility and assistance. Without that, we cannot finish today's session in time. And I also want to thank all participants' engagement and also your sacrifice for having a shorter lunch break. All the presentations delivered today will be posted on the WTO SPS Gateway page. I will also make a short factual report on today's discussions that will be shared with delegate, delegates by email and included in the summary report of the formal meeting. We will reconvene in person and through Interprify for the informal meeting of the SPS committee tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Geneva time. Thank you. Once again, the thematic session is now closed. <laughs>